we, we are celebrating uh, this, this Lord's Day, and we're celebrating the resurrection. Um, and so we're going to jump into scriptures that talk about that. But before we actually get to the resurrection, I want to read to you this scripture. It's found in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. We're told, don't let anyone take you captive with empty philosophy. I don't know about you, but this, to me at least, is a very accurate description of the world around us. A world that has embraced, a world that has been filled with empty philosophies and empty promises. In fact, our world is going to try to convince you and me that they have everything we need, that they have everything you and I need. They, they want to convince you that if you will just take this little pill, you will be happy. But the truth is, that little pill may, cost, may give you some momentary uh, escape, but it comes with a lifetime of cost. The world is going to tell us, hey, if you have a bigger house, you will be happy. If you have a newer car, you will be happy. If you have a different job, or sometimes even a different family, you will be happy. They make all sorts of promises, but once again, they're empty promises. They're empty promises. On the other side of those decisions, so often comes problems that we couldn't even have foreseen on our side of it. The world tells us, Hey, you need to lose weight. Hey, you need to get in shape. Hey, you need to buy the newest styles of clothing that have the biggest price tags. If you do that, then you will feel good about yourself. But still, there are people in our world that have a deep, deep longing in their heart for something more. For something more. James Emery White shared a story about a comedian. Maybe you remember this comedian. His name was Yakov Smirnov. Yakov Smirnov, he's an old time comedian. You know, we got to go back a few years for Yakov Smirnov. But he said that when he first came to the United States from Russia, he wasn't prepared for the incredible variety of instant products available to the, uh, in the American grocery store. He says, on my first trip shopping at the grocery store, I saw powdered milk. You just add water, and boom. You got milk. Then I walked a little farther and I saw powdered orange juice. You just add water and boom, you have orange juice. He said, I went a little farther and I saw baby powder. And I thought to myself, what a country. What a, a country. <laughs> you know, the truth is, the truth is, that is our world. That is our country. That is the world around us. They, they think that you can somehow make the process of happiness, you can boil it down to something that's, that's instantaneous. In fact, they, they promise if you just do these three things, you will have joy in your life. If you just take this 90 days, your, your body will be transformed formed into something else. If you just take these six steps, you're going to find financial freedom. And on and on and on they go. And with all these quick fixes, there's still a growing sense of, of emptiness. There's, a, there's a, a growing longing in our nation for something more, something greater than just this. I want you to watch a, a video I've got here for you. Uh, as you watch this, watch this video, just, just think about all the promises our world makes. A man fell in a hole. He fell in a hole, and he couldn't get out. A traveler passed by. He told the man to meditate, to purify his mind, and when he reached Nirvana, all suffering would cease. 
The man did as he was told, but he remained in the hole. Another man appeared. He explained that the hole didn't exist, and neither, in fact, did the man. It was all an illusion. The man who did not exist was still stuck in the hole that was not there. Another visitor arrived. He instructed the man to perform good deeds to improve his karma, and though he would still die in the hole, he might be reincarnated as something magnificent. Another man looked down from above. He taught the man to pray five times a day facing east and to follow five important tenets. If he was faithful, one day, perhaps, the divine would set him free. The man prayed as best he could, but he was losing strength, and in the hole he remained. Another man appeared. There was something different about him. He called down to the man in the hole and asked him if he wanted to be free. This man lowered himself into the earth, into the pit. He took hold of the man and dragged him into the light. And the man in the hole, who could not get himself out, was saved. Today, I think it's time for us to take all the blinders off that our world seems to constantly be putting on us and recognize the hope we have because the man from above climbed in to the hole. In fact, today we celebrate that he came out of that hole and brought all of us who are willing with him to, to an eternity in the very presence of of God. That's what we celebrate today. Today, That is what should transform our lives. Maybe today it's time for us to start, stop running after the simple and the easy and the things of this world and start running after Jesus. Today we come face to face with the answer to our problems. Today we celebrate the emptiness of Easter. John 19, let's start right there. John 19, starting verse 38 through 42. Let me read it to you. Afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus because he feared the Jewish leaders, asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. When Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body away. With him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night, he brought about 75 pounds of perfume, uh, perfumed ointment made from myrrhs and aloes. Following Jewish burial custom, they wrapped Jesus' body with spices in long sheets of linen cloth. The, 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 uh, excuse me, the place of crucifixion was near a garden where there was a new tomb never used before. And so because it was the day of preparation for the Jewish Passover, and since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Now you might be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, Todd, I thought we were talking about Easter. I thought we were talking about the resurrection. I thought we were going to focus on the empty tomb. And we are, but before we get there, we need to take a moment and look at the empty cross. When we look at the empty cross, we find that it is filled with promise for you and for me. When Jesus cried out, it is finished on the cross, he was declaring that a debt had been paid and it had been paid in full. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, it says, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. No, no. 
It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. I want you to understand there are promises on the emptiness of Easter. And the first one we need to recognize is that the empty cross promises that we have been freed. The empty cross promises that we have been freed. Think about how freeing it is to know that Jesus paid the debt of your sin and my sin. In Romans 6, verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. All of the sin that we participated in, it brought about death. It was required for us to pay with death, and Jesus paid that. He gave us a free gift of God. Uh, The free gift that God gave us was eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, we often forget just how deadly our sin is, but because of Jesus, we have been set free. Your sin has been paid for. My sin has been paid for. Jesus completed his mission. When you see the empty cross, you need to recognize that that empty cross comes with a promise that you and I have been freed. There's a mission service, and as the preacher was leaving that evening, he was in a hurry. He had to catch the very last train out of town. And so he's heading to the train as fast as he can when all of a sudden there's a man behind him calling out, Oh, sir! Oh, sir, can you help me? I'm very curious about my salvation. I'm very anxious about whether I'm saved or not. The preacher took a moment and stopped. He turned to the man. He said, hey, my train, it just arrived, and it is the last one. I've got to go. But he said, look up Isaiah 53, verse 6. He says, when you look it up, go in at the first all and go out at the last all. Good night. And he ran off to his train. The man stood there staring at him with disappointment as he runs off to catch the train. He muttered to himself, go in in the first all and go out at the last all. What in the world does that mean? The man arrived home and he got out his Bible and he looked up Isaiah 53 verse 6. Isaiah 53 verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray and we have turned everyone, excuse me, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of his all. Go in at the first all, he repeated to himself. All we like sheep have gone astray. I am to go in with that all, he said. Yes, I see. It it just means that I am one of those who have gone astray. And go out with the last all, he said. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of his all. He said, yes, I see. I'm to go out free with those whose iniquity has been laid on Christ. Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6. We'll have to back up there a minute. Kind of hit those a little early. Here we go. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Next screen. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Jesus paid the price for you and for me. He paid a price so you and I couldn't or wouldn't have to pay it. He traded his righteousness. He came to you as if it were. He came to you and to me and he said, Hey, I'm going to give you my righteousness and in return, I'm going to take from you your sin. He ransomed us from an empty way of life into a life that is full, a life that is mighty, a life that is free. You and I have been freed from the consequences of our sin. And my question is, are you living that way? Are you living that freedom? The empty cross comes with a promise. You've been free. You've been freed. Now let's look at the tomb. Starting in chapter 20, verse 1 through 10 of John. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there. While the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. And he saw 
And he believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scripture that said Jesus must rise from the dead. And they went home. We come now to the empty tomb, and the empty tomb also has a promise. The empty tomb promises life. The empty tomb promises you and me life. Now, there have been many, many people who have tried to explain away the empty tomb. So many people have tried to explain away the empty tomb. The, the, the truth is that if you can get rid of the empty tomb, you can get rid of Christianity. And so many people do not want Christianity in this world for whatever reason. I don't understand it, but they want to destroy the church. And so many people try to explain away the empty tomb. Some say that the disciples stole Jesus's body, but this seems completely unlikely. In fact, impossible, at least to me, because the tomb was guarded by soldiers and the disciples were in hiding. They were afraid to be seen. So how could they have possibly stolen the body? They were afraid that they would be arrested and killed as well. So that one doesn't make much sense to me. Some say that Jesus never died, that he merely swooned. I don't know if you've ever heard this. So he swooned and the coolness of the tomb revived him. Once again, I think this is impossible. Uh, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. The Romans had declared him dead. In fact, in order to make sure that he was dead, they took a spear and they shoved it in his side up into his, under his rib cage until it pierced his heart. Now, even if Jesus could have by some great stretch of the imagination, survive the beatings and the floggings, being nailed to cross in crucifixion, the spear in his side, he could not have, in his weakened condition, unwrapped his body, rolled back the stone from inside the tomb, and walked away without the guards noticing him. See, to me, the evidence is completely devoid of any truth. I mean, uh, uh, at least that claim is completely devoid of any truth. Some insist that the disciples wanted so badly to see Jesus rise from the dead that they hallucinated. And so they saw him just with an hallucination. Once again, I, I just don't see how this is true because they didn't believe Jesus was going to rise from the dead. In fact, in the text I just read, it said they did not understand from Scripture that he had to rise from the dead. By the way, one person might have an hallucination, but multiple people at different places and different times all having the same hallucination? That makes no sense either. Keep in mind that over 500 eyewitnesses saw Jesus over a 40-day period. Some of them touched him. Many, or All of them heard him. They saw him. And some even ate with the risen Jesus. So none of these seem to make any sense to me. See, the empty tomb declares that God has a power over death, that Jesus is alive. And because of that fact, we know that we too can have eternal life, that we too are alive in him. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says this, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, Jesus defeated death, and as Christians, we too have been declared victors because of his victory. In Romans 8, verses 10 and 11, this is what it tells us. It says, as Christ lives within you, so even though your body will, will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. The empty tomb promises life. How many of you have ever watched a movie a second time? Anybody ever watch a movie a second time? I've watched many movies more than a second time, a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time. I, I, I like watching movies just to let you know. But if you've ever watched a movie that you've already seen, the first time through, maybe there was this very suspenseful time as you're, as you're watching this movie. But as you're watching it a second time, that suspense is no longer there. Because you know how the story ends. You know that the good guy is not going to fall off the cliff. You know that the bad guy is eventually going to get caught. You still enjoy the movie. In fact, since you're not tied up to the plot, you begin to appreciate other aspects of the movie. 
You, you like the clever dialogue of the movie, or you, you like the outstanding camera work of the movie, or, or maybe you, you like the special effects of the movie, and on and on you go. You, you enjoy other things about the movie, but you're not worried because you've already seen it. You know how it ends. So you enjoy it on a whole different level. I want you to understand as a Christian, that's how you and I can live this life. We can enjoy life differently. We can enjoy life as, as if we're viewing it for a second time, even though we're not. We're going through it the first time this, and the only time, but, but we can kind of look at it like we're watching a movie a second time because we don't have to sweat the outcome. We know that God ultimately has it all under control. We, we need not wonder if he's going to take care of us. We, we don't have to worry about whether he can work out everything for our good. We know what the end is. We know that he has overcome. We know that Jesus defeated death. And through him, we can live a conquering life. We, we can enjoy this journey of life differently than the rest of the world because we know the ending of the story. We already know where we're going. And we know who has secured that place for us. Every day is part of the celebration. Even the tough days if you know God's promise of life eternal. And that's what Jesus gives us here. The empty tomb gives us life. In John 10, 10, one of my favorite verses, Jesus says this. He says, the thief, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy, but my purpose is to give them rich and satisfying life. Jesus came to give you and me a real, a rich, an abundant a satisfying life that lasts from here through eternity. He came so that you and I could enjoy a life that is, that is just different because we know the outcome. We know the end. Are you living that kind of life? Because that's the promise of the empty tomb. A life, an abundant life, even through the hard times. Now, there's one last thing that the emptiness of Easter gives us, and I want to explore it this morning. It is the emptiness of the grave clothes, because they also come with a promise. Even if we don't readily see the promise, there is a promise in the empty grave clothes of Jesus. Now, you may look at this and simply see Jesus get rid of getting, getting rid of these grave clothes because he'd risen. So he didn't need them. He didn't want them and he got, got rid of them. You may look at it like that. But since he did leave them behind and since the scripture mentions what he did with them, maybe we need to look closer at them. For instance, in verses six and seven, let's look at it once more. It says, then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Now, I think this scripture's in here for some specific reasons. And one of those reasons, I believe, is because there is a rabbinic tradition connected to a napkin, a cloth, a rabbinic tradition that every Jewish boy would have understood, that every Jewish boy would have, would have heard in the past. See, when a servant set up uh, 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 the, the dinner table for, table for his master, he made sure it was exactly the way the master wanted it to be. And then the servant would wait a little bit out of, the, out of sight until the master was done and finished e eating. Then, and only then, would the servant touch the table. He dare not touch the table until the master was finished. So if the master was finished eating, he would get up, he would wipe his hands, he would wipe his mouth, he would wipe his beard, and he'd wad the napkin up and drop it on the table. And then the servant knew that he could go and clear the table. However, in that tradition, one of the theories is if the master got up from the table and folded the napkin beside the plate, the servant did not dare touch the table because the folded napkin meant, I am coming back. And I think that's exactly what the empty grave clothes tell us. The empty grave clothes come with a promise that Jesus is coming back. That Jesus is coming back. 
In fact, even if you don't take the explanation of the empty grave clothes as that promise, Jesus, in fact, tells us that very thing in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Jesus is coming back. And as we anxiously await his return, we need to eagerly and urgently proclaim the promises of the empty cross. The empty cross, our sins are forgiven. We've been freed from that. We need to proclaim the promise of the empty tomb. We have life eternal. And we need to promise the, or we need to proclaim the promise of the empty clothes that Jesus is coming again. There is an entire world of people outside these walls who have embraced the promises of the world, not realizing that those promises are empty. And instead, we need to show them that they need to embrace the emptiness of Easter because in that emptiness, there is promise that lasts forever. You don't have to leave here today empty. You and I, we can enjoy those promises. If you are a child of the King, I pray that you are enjoying the promises of the empty Easter. Freedom. Life. Jesus is coming again.